Thank you very much. Uh, this is a real challenging. First of all, a session having post lunch, and second, uh, speaking something about chemotherapy, something about medical management for the surgeons. So let me see to what extent I can substantiate myself here. Just bear with me for 15 minutes. Let me see how it goes on. So to start with disclaimer, there's nothing to uh, uh, disclose other than that I am a pediatric oncologist and I only deal with medical treatment. So the things which will be covered in, our to in my topic is uh, I'll be giving some introduction about hepatoblastoma. Uh, how do we diagnose kids with hepatoblastoma? How do, we uh, how do we stage them and what is the method that risk certification uh, method is followed and how do we treat medical, uh, medically and followed by a new trial which is coming up with some words about uh, PHIIT trial. So to introduce, uh, as such uh, primary liver tumors in children are very rare, as such primary uh, uh, pediatric tumors are rare in that primary liver tumors uh, are very rare to that extent like 1% of the primary you know, pediatric tumors. Uh, incidence if I speak to it is about 0.13% patients per uh, uh, lakh population. You can just imagine that it's so rare. Uh, and also the thing which has been seen over the decades is that there is an increasing trend of uh, incidence of this pediatric uh, liver tumors and it is uh, suggested that could be because of improved neonatal care and by that, preterm uh, are getting survived and then we know that the uh, hepatoblastoma has got some tendency uh, to develop in preterm babies, especially those who are born with birth weight of less than 1 kg. So the risk factors which have been seen uh, for this hepatoblastoma to be seen in kids is weight less than 1 kg at birth, which increases about 15, per 15 times the risk of hepatoblastoma in those kids. And there are some other genetic factors which are important to see that there are some uh, uh, risk factors like Accardi syndrome, beckwith midman syndrome, familial adenosis polyposis, glycogen storage disease 1, uh, one to 4, Simpson's and trisomy 18 are some of the genetic disorders which are associated with increased risk of hepatoblastomas. So how do you diagnose these kids? So uh, as such, clinical correlation is very important in this. And there are some range of presentations which are seen in this uh, disease. It can be like a kid presenting with asymptomatic abdominal distension to a condition where a child can present with acute abdomen, which is probably due to rupture of the disease, rupture of the tumor. So there can be uh, some other presentations like loss of abdominal domain due to the tumor resulting uh, in respiratory distress and also some rare presentations of uh, hepatoblastomas like uh, paraneoplastic syndrome or precocious puberty. Even precocious puberty is one of the symptoms which is associated with uh, presentation of hepatoblastoma. And obviously elevated AFP is a part of this. So how do you diagnose, how do you work up? So first and foremost is clinical. Uh, as as is very, very less likely that you, you miss out on a child with less than, a, less than three year old presenting with a liver tumor with the elevated AFP, you are, most of the times, you are, you are correct with the diagnosis of hepatoblastoma. So that's how it goes. But uh, biopsy is recommended for these kids to have a histopathological categorization. And also there are some conditions where you try to avoid uh, biopsies. These are some of the relative contraindications. Like if you are suspecting it to have infantile hepatic hemangioma, or focal nodular hyperplasia is one of the uh, relative contraindication for getting a biopsy. Infantile hepatic choriocarcinoma need not get a biopsy. If you have very high elevated beta HCG along with a tumor in the liver, you need not get a biopsy. It is hepato uh, hepatic uh, choriocarcinoma. Or if you are planning for afferent surgery, it is said that you need not do a biopsy when you are resecting the mass. And the third one is tumor markers. Like if you, uh, you need to get serum AFP and beta HCG, so if, uh, looking at the values along with correlation with the clinical and image. The other category where patients were not amenable for surgery were divided into intermediate risk and high risk depending on the distant metastasis present or absent and AFP level being high or low. Okay? So this is the risk stratification system followed by North American people. When you, when you see, try to fix this pretext type into them, it looks like this. 
the where pretext 1 and 2 were in low risk, very low risk and low risk, and pretext 3, 2, 4 were in intermediate risk. So there is very haphazardly mixing up of patients in when you see this COG type of uh, risk stratification. And you can see this Sayapal German people and then uh, you know uh, Japan study. What they did was they also had the similar uh, looking uh, stratification by pretext, but still when you try to compare all four st uh, study groups for risk stratification, you can see that they are haphazardly you know, uh, distributed. It just looks like this. You know, you, it's very difficult to compare all the, stat all the studies and to draw some conclusions that which patients are actually good and which patients are actually not doing good. So it's like comparing apples and oranges. So sensing this, because there was a problem in risk stratifying, so there was a society which was formed, there was a collaboration, international collaboration which was done by uh, uh, all those uh, four study groups and formed Children's Hepatic Tumors International Collaboration called as CHIC. It was done in 2011 and then they, they did a study by taking all the trials of a major four study groups and clubbed together and studied with this backbone of pretext staging. They took about 1,600 patients and studied all the backgrounds and came, into, came to conclusion and drawn some very significant points that were having some important, uh, you know, very important uh, uh, risk factors which were identified that had significantly increased risk of event fee survival events. So those were advanced pretext group, microvascular venous or portal involvement, contagious hepatic disease, uh, primary tumor multifocality, and tumor rupture at enrollment were very significant to have event fee survival events. And some of the factors which were having worst outcome, whatever you do, they were more than eight years of age, AFP level if it is less than 100, and metastatic disease at diagnosis were going to be a worse outcome. So they, they proposed one other new system of risk stratifying the patients by taking seven factors. So those were pretext staging, that is by doing imaging, metastatic stage, AFP level, annotation factors, age of the patient, and upfront resectability. These were the seven points which were taken into consideration, and they have tried to divide the patients into four uh, risk groups. So these are like this, like pretext one, that can be uh, low risk, intermediate, or high risk, or very low risk. So by looking at all these factors, you can divide the patients into four categories. So if it is a pretext one, it can still be high risk, or low risk, or very low risk. Pretext two, you can still be having any uh, uh, no, risk stratification. And it follows like pretext three and pretext four. So this is a system which is presently suggested and followed for the upcoming trial. And this looks much better to understand and try to stratify in a uniform way. So coming to treatment, what is the best treatment for epitoblastoma? Each and everyone know that if you remove the tumor properly and if you remove the tumor nicely, then it is done. So complete tumor resection remains the cornerstone of definitive treatment. And surgery is the only realistic chance of long-term disease-free survival for hepatoblastoma kids. This is for sure. But what is the role of chemotherapy? Yes, there is a role of chemotherapy because approximately only about 20 to 30 percent of the patients with hepatoblastoma will be having resectable disease at presentation. So what, what about the rest 70 to 80 percent? You need to have something to do before they are taken up for surgery and hepatoblastoma is a chemosensitive disease and we know that there is a data which shows about 30 to 50 percent of the patients can be downstaged by giving chemotherapy and they can be uh, you know, made ready for partial hepatectomy instead of liver transplantation too. So when it comes to treatments approach there is still a controversy there is like a misunderstanding between American and uh, European uh, way of approach. There are two different ways of approach. What they do in COG and uh, Japan, they do afferent surgery for pretext 1 and 2. In Sayapal, they do neoadjuvant chemotherapy for everyone. But the survival has seen to be similar whatever approach you are taking up. So that's fair enough. So it's up to you to decide which one to, which one to follow, but to be following, you need to be following only one method. That's what the suggestion would be. So the chemotherapy drugs which are sensitive to hepatoblastoma are all this. And this is the Sayapal, how they did uh, over the decades. And then they found that 
you know, the best method uh, to do from their point of view is do chemotherapy and then try to see the sensitivity of the disease, make the disease as much as possible smaller and then do the surgery. So this is the method of chemotherapy what we also follow here where uh, for a patient with standard risk we give four cycles of cisplatin followed by surgery and then two cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. Okay, so this is the simple straightforward the, uh, uh, chemotherapy which is given every two weekly. So this is a bit intensive but it is going to be, uh, you know, uh, it has yielded uh, good results uh, in, in, the, in the tumor of about 85 to 90 percent of the kids are doing good with this. And this is the suggested high risk protocol from Cyopal where uh, this is called a super plado where cisplatin is alternated with carboplatin and doxorubicin every two weeks. We, we assess disease after four cycles, if amenable go ahead for surgery, if not after uh, after three more cycles, delayed surgery followed by three more adjuvant chemotherapy. So the, th the, the approach what American people suggested is this, where they divide the children into four uh, categories like very low, low risk will undergo surgery followed by two cycles of chemotherapy. Intermediate will have five cycles but their chemotherapy schedule is different. They use cisplatin, vincustin, doxorubicin and five fluorouracil. This is their background, back, uh, you know, backbone. And also in high risk, they add when irnotican and timotem serolimus. Said and done, the results are very similar. Probably in high risk, Cyopel has won and it has shown better results than the American protocol. So uh, presently with this uh, view, they have suggested that need to collaborate and then world has come together to form this uh, protocol called as Pediatric Hepatic International Tumor Trial, where which is presently undergoing and then it is following the chick group uh, uh, risk certification for hepatoblastomas where the so this is this involves all uh, hepatic tumors so hepatic tumors when I say it means that it is involving uh, hepatocellular carcinoma also for this topic it is only hepatoblastoma so I will cover up that so there hepatoblastoma treatment in hepatoblastoma treatment the children are divided into four groups group A, B, C, D and the uh, the first approach is like do the surgery if it is amenable and then leave it if the surgery if the uh, um, uh, if the histology is favorable, if not favorable, do chemotherapy. The major controversy is here, what to do if the patient is having, uh, you know, uh, a resected uh, disease but having unfavorable disease, whether to go ahead with two cycles of cisplatin or four cycles of cisplatin has been tested. And second randomization is for those kids who are having intermediate disease, where to which one to follow, whether to follow Cyopal high risk protocol or C5VD which is completely a different kind of chemotherapy protocol or whether to follow Cyopal 4 protocol. So this is one which is going to give very good results, probably it will be very clear uh, once the results are on which one is better. And the third randomization is all those patients who are having metastatic disease which chemotherapy is going to downstage them properly and then make them amenable for surgery. Thank you. Let me know if you have any questions.